Hey everyone, welcome into another episode of Dirt Tracker Conversations. I know it's been a while since we did one of these, but I've got a good one for you this week. Just off of his USAC National Sprint Car Championship for 2021, Brady Bacon joins me on the show this time to talk about his season, his absolutely insane consistency. Uh, we talk his big crashes at Lawrenceburg and Terre Haute this season, which he turned around and was still able to finish in the top five at those races. Uh, we talk about his off-season plans, we talk some midget racing, the state of USAC, uh, a lot of things coming up with Brady. It's about 30 minutes, uh, so enjoy the episode. Twenty twenty one USAC National Sprint Car Champion Brady Bacon. Brady, you we are what a couple of days now off of the the Western World and you clinching the championship and and you do it in a big way. You grab the win on Friday night. You come back, uh, finish fifth on Saturday. Tell me about just kind of your overall impressions of the season and and kind of you know what it took for you guys to bag your your second in a row championship and, and fourth career championship. Yeah, this season was probably one of the most difficult that I can recall as far as. Uh just bad circumstances. Um, you know, sometimes you have a bad year cause you're missing some speed during certain portions of the year, but that was never an issue. Um, it was just one thing after another, things that were kind of out of our control that were happening, getting in wrecks, uh, tore up a, a few cars, which is not typical for us and, uh, having just broke up a, a roll pin in the mag rolling out for the feature one night, didn't even get to race. So stuff like that was, it was just, all the time, bad, you know, races when we had a car capable of winning, but we didn't have the starting position capable of winning. So it, that got a little frustrating for a while, but um, true to my team's normal form, we just kept kept our nose down, kept working hard, doing what we knew was the right thing to do, and, and it all worked out in the end. Tell me about your competition this year. KTJ was, I mean, just like a completely different driver, it seemed like this year versus last year. He was so good all season. You knew Leary was going to be good. Tanner Thorson was really good in, in his first kind of full season in a sprint car. But what was it like going up against these guys kind of on a night-to-night -night basis all year? Yeah, you know, the guys that we've raced with for a long time, Justin, um, they all kind of have their – Justin, Chris, KT is, are the ones I've raced with the longest. They all kind of – they seem to develop patterns, you know, every year. Some people excel during certain parts of the year or they just – you know, there's waves for everybody. We had our – time when we didn't feel like we were running as good as we should have and we had uh, you know at the end of the year it kind of picked back up so um they're all very consistent we're all very consistent in USAC it's hard to make or lose points throughout the year unless something happens um so those nights when things are going bad to be able to salvage those nights is probably the most important part about winning the championship because uh, you know whereas maybe someone else would have a problem and they run 13th or 12th we can usually rebound at least get a top five so that was probably a key to uh you know beating them night in and night out is to rebound you you talk about that consistency and it's like in looking at your numbers it's like the one thing that just immediately smacks you in the face is you know this year 41 top tens and 43 starts and, and over the last two years 65 top tens and 70 starts do you realize like when you're in the middle of this, that you, you're doing this, that you're being this consistent, or do you just kind of stay focused night to night? And, and I feel like when you ask drivers this, they say, no, no, I'm focused night to night. But are, are you really, or, or do you realize how consistent you're being? Uh, not, not really. I don't really think about it. I didn't really realize that we, obviously we don't finish in the, out of the top 10 very often. And we know that, but uh, when you see the numbers all compiled, it's uh makes it a little more impressive, I guess, but, um, we just try to work, you know, DJ LeBeau is my full-time guy here in the shop and he's kind of the, the backbone probably of that consistency works really hard in the shop. Um, my role has changed over the years. There's a lot more talking on the phone with sponsors, partners, parts, suppliers, helping Ciciano with the merchandise part. That part's kind of blown up in the last few years. So, um, you know, my role is just being in the shop, working on race cars, which is what you would envision yourself doing when you want to be a race car driver. Um, it's not, I don't get to do that as much as I used to be able to, or have to. So he, uh, is really good, picks up the slack, has everything ready in tip top shape every time we get to the racetrack. So if there is a, a problems that can be avoided, he does a good job of doing that. Sometimes, obviously there's stuff that you can't foresee, 
but uh, we have a great race car every time it goes to the track and then Matt kind of meets us at the track and we work together on the shocks and the setup and just kind of keep tweaking on things. We keep our package as close to the same as we can all the time, no major changes. So we can uh, just refine and refine every night. The thing that really stands out to me besides your consistency when kind of looking at your stats is, is just your ability to move forward in features. And, and I'm wondering is that, you know, you keeping up with the racetrack? Is that adjustments you guys are making ahead of time? Like what allows you to, it, it, it seems like really no matter where you start, you're going to end up top five, you're going to end up top 10. And, and, you know, what allows you to do that on a nightly basis? Um, I think we always kind of maybe set up for different parts of the racetrack than everybody else. We try to be where we can, you know, we don't just set up for the top or set up for the bottom. If anything, we probably set up for the bottom more than the top because that seems to be more popular now. Everyone else is running the top of the cushion. And if we can find a way to make the bottom work, it clears the path a lot easier. So, um, and we just have a really, you know, try to have a really good um, balanced car every night and that, uh, and make good decisions. You know, sometimes you just got to wait. And, uh, you know, a lot of the, we've been to these tracks a lot and there's things that happen throughout the race that you kind of look for to be able to capitalize. Maybe the middle might come in for five laps and you can pick off several cars um, in those five laps. And if you miss that window, it makes it pretty tough. Once it, the end of the race is once the track's kind of used up, it gets pretty hard to pass. Tell me about Matt Hummel. I know he's a guy you've worked with for, for a while and, you know, factory cane Indy. And, and I would imagine he has an incredible knowledge of, of, of shocks and setups and things like that. But what does a guy like him bring to your program? That brings a lot of stability. Um, you know, I don't have to, he he's, hasn't, didn't come to every race this year. He's kind of trying to uh, maybe step back a little bit, focus on his business and his family. Um, so when he's not there, my plate gets a lot fuller and I have to, you know, think about a lot more things than I would when he is there. Um, we're usually on the same page. We kind of work together on setups and stuff, but usually, you know, what I would, you know, when I ask him, well, you know, what do you think? What he says is what I was going to do any, what I would do if he wasn't there. So, um, you know, working with someone for such a long period of time really helps, you know, build that chemistry and understanding of each other. And, you know, he, uh, you, you know, push me sometimes to be a little more aggressive with the setup and, uh, and that helps a lot. And just, uh, that consistency and stability is definitely what he brings the most. And then obviously, um, the shocks, shock programs are one of the most important parts of your race team now and having such a, you know, tight relationship with a guy that actually builds them. We can, we can try stuff, little stuff, um, especially with nothing else changing. We've run triple X chassis for years and years and years, dec over a decade. So that's a, you know, we try to keep those variables constant so we can make adjustments on shock packages and stuff and really feel what the difference is and make improvements. Uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you, the, you, you went for two kind of big tumbles this year, I, I, one at Lawrenceburg and obviously the, the one I think a lot of people know about at Terre Haute, where, you, I mean, you look like you were headed to the moon and, but somehow you come back, you finish fourth at Lawrenceburg, you finish third at Terre Haute, like walk me through those race nights. Like, how do you get to the point where you have that big of a crash and still end up finishing in the top five? Yeah, fortunately those crashes were in the heat race. So it gave us some time to, uh, you know, pull a backup car down, which, you know, I, I knew DJ had prepared and ready. Uh, it was already down by the time I got back to the pits at Terre Haute. Um, and, you know, people ask, how, how do you, you know, put that out of your mind? I didn't feel like either one of those crashes had anything to do with anything that I did in the race car, so I couldn't avoid them. Uh, we both just got ran over um, from behind. So when you make a mistake or the track, you know, you bike up by yourself, it can get in your head a little bit easier um might slow you down a little bit but i just felt like those crashes didn't were no fault of my own so i didn't have a problem getting back in the next car and and picking right back up where we left off for for the people that have not driven a sprint car like myself are those crashes like as violent as they look in, in the car or do you, i mean do you feel them to the, the things slow down to things speed up like what does it actually feel like when you're in the car yeah, it's hard to explain, you know, when you first start crashing, you kind of, that's when you realize, okay, I'm crashing. And then Terre Haute was obviously a long pause um, in the air, which is not typically good, but got fortunate and landed kind of just right on the tail tank. And it absorbed a lot of the energy and kind of kept rolling down the hill. Um, 
Lawrence Burks crash hurt a lot worse than uh, Terre Haute's, but uh, I looked a little scarier after Terre Haute. It uh, flipped a little faster and popped some blood vessels in my eye. But um, yeah, I don't really think you don't really you don't really have time to think. You're just kind of brace yourself and and hope uh, you don't hit anything too awfully hard. Uh, you won two of the last four races to end the year, grabbed a win at Paris, grabbed a win at Arizona. Um, you are, you know, we, we, we've talked about your consistency, but you, you've also won a boatload of races in the last two years. And, and I, I don't want to like, t- you know, kind of take that out of the conversation is, is how often you are able to win. But when you're coming down the stretch like that in a championship battle, are you trying to points race? Are you just trying to go out and win every single night? Like, where's your kind of mindset as, as you kind of come down the stretch here? Uh, well, you know, like I touched on earlier, you can't really afford to just take it easy because KT is going to run in the front every night unless something happens, which he got uh, at Western World. Uh, his luck kind of turned on him and he, you know, had a couple bad nights, whereas, you know, we felt like we had our bad nights earlier in the year. And, you know, the waves always come, you know, you get, you know, frustrated or distracted. But if you're doing stuff right and you got a fast race car, the tides are going to turn and things are going to start going your way. And then finally at the end of the year, they did. So um, a little frustrated with like Paris, we finished fifth, but we were disappointed with, we, we felt like we should have been a little bit better. And that was a mistake of ours. Just got a little conservative with the race car, but that will happen every once in a while. Unfortunately for us, it doesn't happen very often, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, you can't really afford to, to take it easy because he's going to run in the front every night and you know, you're going to one point, three points. I mean, one night we lost 12 points at Paris with a top five. So you can't afford to, to back off any. Uh, tell me about the bull at Western world. You always end up with these kind of silly pictures of everybody sitting on the bull. Does the bull cooperate when you want to sit on it? Yeah. When you, when you go to sit on it, he's pretty calm, but like his small movements translate to a lot <laughs> on his back and, you know, his big horns, you know, those are, that's a wide swath to uh to make sure you don't get hit but uh there was one i think i was holding both of them on uh you know their leads and i tried to pull them they're like pull them closer and i pulled pretty hard and they weren't having any of it so i just let them (laughs) stand wherever they wanted to uh you're a guy that we see periodically throughout the year in a wing car you run midget stuff you run silver crown you know, is sprint cars, is it always going to be, or I guess non-wing sprint cars going to always be your focus? Do you, do you have other things you want to do? Is Are other things important to you kind of throughout the season? Um, yeah, I think the next year we're going to try to run a few more wing races. We got uh, Kelly Hank, who owns the uh, TKH Motorsports, who owns the Midget that we run a handful of times. We're going to kind of team up for a, a wing sprint car deal to he's going to kind of help run that to take, so it doesn't take as many resources off of our, you know, non-wing sprint car deal. All the stuff's run out of the same shop. So in order to run wing sprint car races, we do have to sacrifice some resources or, or find some more resources to run. So that's kind of why the last couple of years we haven't ran as many as we used to, but we're hoping to kind of maybe beef that up a little bit more. Um, we don't run as many midget races as we used to. So kind of supplement with some wing races. And we're in a good area. We can go to, Attica, Fremont, Waynesfield, places like that are, are relatively close to our shop. So we're going to try to do a little bit more of that. I think it helps kind of keep keep us fresh, do a little something different, doesn't let things get kind of stale. If you do the same thing over and over, it can get a little, you can get complacent. So we like to go run some wing races and, and have good relationships with some teams that are successful and kind of learn a little bit, um, kind of keep up with what's going on on the other side of the, the sprint car world. But I've tried to run, you know, tried to kind of pull away from non-wing sprint cars a few years ago and run more wing stuff. And then opportunities just came about that non-wing stuff just was where I needed to be. And it just seems like the harder I tried to pull away, the harder it pulled me back. So uh, we just kind of decided, okay, this is probably what we need to focus on and have a lot of great partners, Fat Eds and Gene Franco, yet gives us our engines and um, that really like to do the non-wing stuff. And it obviously works with our location as well. So uh, we like to do other stuff, but we definitely, uh, our bread and butter is definitely non-wing sprint cars. 
Tell me what you think about kind of the state of things right now. Uh, you, you know, from where I sit, it, it seems like the racing with USAC, you know, really with all three divisions is is super great right now. Um, you know, the the attention seems to kind of be raising a little bit with flow and, and you know, but from where you sit, where do you kind of think the, th- you know, think things are with the state of, of USAC and, and the state of non-wing racing? Yeah, I think, I mean, with the popularity of wing racing going up, it, it's inevitable that the popularity of non-wing racing is going to kind of go up with it. Um, we're a little more segmented in the country than wing racing. So a little hard, you know, harder for people that aren't in an area that has a lot of non-wing racing to relate to it maybe. But I think the product on the track speaks for itself. I think it's far superior on track product, um, than maybe wing racing is most of the time, a lot more exciting cars are closer together. Um, so that, you know, once you get people there, I think they get pretty hooked to it. Um, USEX, you know, everyone kind of has their own opinion. Oh, we need to race more places. Well, you gotta, you can race more places, but you also have to realize where your, you know, your staple is and, and they do a good job when we get, you know, Indiana sprint weeks are bigger than ever. Eastern storms are bigger than ever. You know, our our crowds, you gotta take care of what takes care of you. And I think USEX does a good job of that. Obviously we're trying as much as we can to kind of branch out and be more of a national series. Uh, and there's other places in the country, you know, Missouri kind of turned into a little bit of a hotbed of non-wing sprint car racing with the, you know, war series when it kind of started. Now there's a couple series down there. And now Texas actually has kind of started to, to grow in popularity, non-wing sprint car racing. I think the affordability of it probably helps that, um, you know, the engine costs and stuff in wing racing as just keeps going up every year. And uh, you can be competitive with a lot less um, engine cost in non-wing sprint car racing. Well, we know that like parts shortages and some of the supply chain things and tires and all of these things have kind of been an issue all season long. Were you guys affected by that this year? Uh, there was some times in the year where we were limited to how many tires we could get or things like that. I think this off season is probably going to sh- show the biggest supply chain issues on parts. Um, you know, if you're not ahead of the game, I think you might be running some used parts at the beginning of the year. So we tried to kind of get ahead of that and uh, try to have stuff coming in, um, order, put our orders in earlier than we used to. But I think everyone else did the same thing. So um, I think everyone's ordering more because they're scared they're not going to have any, which, you know, puts a bigger strain on the supplier. So um, I think everyone's working as hard as they can to uh, try to keep up. And I will just have to see how it goes. We're pretty fortunate that we've kept a pretty good stock of, of parts and stuff. And DJ does a good job of knowing exactly what tires we need and um, kind of getting them when we can get them. So uh, we are, I think we're in pretty good shape, but it remains to be seen how it'll affect us as the year gets going. Hopefully Hoosier, for example, hopefully the off season will give them a little time to catch up. Uh, I know we talked about it kind of briefly before I started recording, but w- what's your off season look like and, and what's racing next year? I'm, I'm guessing Chili Bowl is, is next thing. Yeah. The actual next race is the Tulsa shootout. So okay. we uh, kind of are one fun race of the year uh and we run for kelly hink in the outlaw classes at that and then another sponsor of ours dragonfly aviation kevin reed kevin and kathy reed we run one of their cars in the other two classes so i grew up racing that race it means a lot to me my dad's won that race a couple times i've won four myself and it's just fun to catch up with people that we don't get to necessarily see all year that i grew up racing with um and now my kids kind of love it they they have a little more freedom to run around um at the shootout and they get to, you know, my kids are playing with the kids of the people that I grew up with. So that's pretty cool to see. Um, and then obviously the chili bowl, but yeah, we don't have a lot of off time necessarily. We don't necessarily race, but, uh, you know, we got to get everything tore down, um, anything sold that needs to be sold, get our engines off, get those rebuilt, um, picking up actually today, later this afternoon, picking up some chassis from powder coat, um, start, you know, mountain bodies, building front ends, all that try to get all our spare stuff. Florida kind of forces you to expedite your off season because you got to pretty much have everything ready for Florida. And then probably the closest thing we have to an off season is after Florida before the stuff in the Midwest starts because we kind of have everything ready. We can kind of take a breath and uh, enjoy some actual off time. You only make a handful uh, or only made a handful of midget starts this year with USAC. And, and, you know, one of the, the races that really stands out in my mind is, is the BC 39 
before we kind of talk about that race specifically, how difficult is it to jump in a midget like that when you're only doing it a few times a year? Is there like a transition period or is it because you've done it so many times that you can just jump in and go fast right away? Yeah, we're usually fast right away. I think in the past, I, when I would run for different teams, it was a lot harder to bounce from different cars and, and things like that. Cause then you have their programs different. They like their car different and you have to adjust to that. Um, and that's kind of the reason we kind of went with what we have now. We got a triple X chassis. I tried to make everything as simple as can be as much like a sprint car as I could possibly make it and just keep everything super, super simple. So every time we went to the track, we knew what we had and that's seemed to work out for us. We had a couple engine issues, which uh, resulted in a couple of DNS, but other than that, I think we were in the top five every race we ran. Um, and that was kind of still learning where we needed to be as far as our setup package. So excited about going to the chili bowl now, having another, you know, few races to figure the, figure the car out and be where we need to be. I think we're going to be, you know, really competitive at chili bowl and we should be competitive every time we decide to go to the track next year, which again, probably not going to be all the time, but maybe, you know, 10 races or something throughout the year where it makes sense. Kind of, I like the smaller tracks, uh, we seem to, you know, race a little better on those. So we'll kind of try to focus on that. Tell me about those closing laps at the BC 39. I think I have a photo of it. it's, it's you, JG Larson, like three wide there late and, and, you know, guys throwing sliders and it's just kind of crazy, but what's it like battling with those guys in the closing laps at, at a race like that, that everybody seems to really want to win? Yeah, I actually kind of was a little upset with myself. I got, I was a little bit busy watching them and trying to make sure I didn't get caught in a wreck. And there was a couple corners there where I kind of missed my marks a little bit. And I think if I would have, uh, you know, made those last four or five laps perfect, I think we would have had a shot to win, but uh, kind of slipped up off the bottom a couple of times and it cost me some time. But, uh, you know, once those guys got free of each other, the top was definitely a little bit faster, but the bottom kind of gave me a lane to uh, escape the chaos a little bit. And uh, we all, it almost worked out, but, Came up a little short, but we were definitely right there and, uh, you know, had a, had a, had a great car and able to once again, kind of go where no one else was able to run and put ourselves in a position to kind of sneak by for the win and, and got close to doing it. Uh, you've been around racing a long time. You've been racing a long time. Uh, your kids are, are, are they allowed to race? Are you encouraging them? Are you discouraging them? Like where, where do you stand on that? Uh, my son's definitely interested. Um, He's going to turn six uh, here actually on Friday. So he's uh, actually going to turn five. Sorry. I got three kids. It's hard to keep up with the numbers. <laughs> so my oldest daughter's turning seven and my oldest or my son's turning five. They actually share the same birthday. Um, so he's definitely interested. He's got a go-kart four wheeler. He, he rips on those pretty good. Um, so he's not scared to, to get on the gas, but uh I don't know if he's quite ready for uh, actual, you know, competition racing, but we'll definitely keep him on the go-karts and four wheelers and stuff and keep him up to speed and kind of see where it goes and maybe start, uh, you know, maybe next season sometime start uh, dabbling in it. I got a lot of offers to, Hey, let him come drive this car or that car. But um, you know, with as busy as we are, it makes it a little more difficult to, uh, to get to a racetrack like that. But um definitely want he, he seems to be interested so i'm sure it'll happen here in the next few years my oldest daughter doesn't really uh have a whole lot of express a whole lot of interest in it and then uh my youngest daughter's actually probably the crazy one so hope, hopefully she isn't as interested because that might be an expensive part bill because she's pretty wild where does uh where does mom land on all of this is she okay with that yeah she's okay with it she can kind of see you know like the first time lowry got in a go-kart he just went wide open and, 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 you know, was pretty under control. She was like, wow, I guess that, I guess it kind of comes, it's kind of bred into you a little bit. She, she kind of thought that was cliche until she maybe saw it and was like, wow, you know, he can't, he played flag football this year and, you know, had a hard time staying focused from play to play for, you know, 10 or 15 minutes. And he can go out there and ride his go-kart in circles for an hour. And, and, you know, not get tired of it. So that's definitely probably what he likes to do the most. He plays with cars all the time, play, you know, um, and likes to get on his go-kart and stuff. So we'll see how it goes. 
Uh, tell me about championship celebrations. Have, has there been a party? Is there going to be a party? Uh, and, and how long do you allow yourself to kind of soak it in before you, you kind of move on mentally? Friday night in Arizona, we kind of uh, indulged a little bit. Stayed, uh, unfortunately, everything's kind of closed out there pretty early. But we just kind of opened the side door of the trailer and had a couple of drinks. And then, uh, you know, Saturday back to business and it kind of got late and everyone's kind of ready to get on the road, had an early flight. But this Saturday, we actually have a shop party um, for our uh, all of our sponsors. I have a lot of family and friends coming into town and uh, there'll be probably close to 100 people here at our shop. So it also makes us it forces us to clean our shop and kind of purge the season's mess and all the extra stuff that doesn't really need to be here. We get to throw away and get a good deep clean and it gives us a good uh, a base for our off season uh, maintenance and stuff. Uh, before I let you go, I, I'm always curious with guys and, and this is something I've asked Brad Sweet about and, and you know, a lot of different guys that we've kind of had on that have had a ton of success kind of at some of these higher levels, but I'm curious for you in particular, your kind of preparation for uh, for race nights and, and for seasons. Obviously, we've talked about your consistency, the number of race wins, back to back championships. What does it take for you mentally, physically with the car, things like that, for you to be prepared to go win every single night of the week and, and, and to be prepared to race against the guys that you have to every every night? Uh, I think the just the work of the shop and being confident and, you know, my guys level of preparation helps a lot it takes a lot of you know burden off of me I don't have to worry about is the car going to be ready or is it going to be right um so like on race day I can kind of chill out kind of for the most of the day uh Ciciana, obviously we have our t-shirt trailer at most of the races so we try to get there early get set up um and then kind of take a few hours eat lunch with the kids play with the kids relax I try to sneak in a nap if uh if the kids are calm enough to let me do that um it's a good one you know the youngest one needs to take a nap I can use I'll go I'll go lay her down I'll go lay her down so then I can maybe catch 20 30 minutes of sleep too and then um kind of getting in a routine like that especially during the busy time of the summer is pretty helpful and um you know being kind of refreshed and ready to go and help Ciciana set this you know racks out and stuff right before I go to the pits and um kind of get things rolling about four o'clock usually so having a, a nice routine like that helps when things get thrown off it it adds a little bit more stress and things can uh you know get forgot or or you know forgot about or m mistakes can be made if then kind of things get thrown off so we try to keep a pretty solid routine but i'm not much about uh you know working out all the time or anything like that i i as i get older i have to be a little more conscious of my diet and things like that but uh, I just try to race and, and work as hard as I can. And it seems to be working out for me so far. Are you a, a research guy? Are you going back and watching old races? Do you have like notebooks that you look back to see setup stuff? Or where are you with that? I'm not real huge on um, watching races back. Um, I just, a lot of it's just time. You know, it's kind of a black hole. You could get yourself caught down in um, kind of like, you know, cat videos on YouTube, you watch one race and then you want to go see the other one, but we do, we've kept really good notes, uh, over the last, you know, five or six years. And another thing, we keep everything the same. Um, we don't change chassis, got the same shocks, all of that's the same. So we can kind of see our progress throughout those years and kind of know this worked last time with this track. We were kind of doing everything different everywhere else. So we should be able to combine those two and and be good. We're, we're, we're pretty big on, on keeping notes and kind of, I do try to review that before we go to the track. So everyone's on the same page on kind of what we did last time and what usually works and doesn't work at each particular track. Well, Brady, I appreciate the time today. Certainly congratulate you on the championship. Uh, is there Brady Bacon championship merchandise yet? Where can we go to find that? Uh, where, where can we go buy some of that stuff? Yeah. As if anyone knows Ciciana very well, she already had that pretty much ready to go, which I, wasn't a real big fan of kind of superstitious about that. <laughs> I didn't see what she was trying to show me the designs. And I'm like, I don't even want to look at it. Don't tell me about it. Don't talk to me about it. It's not over yet. I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to talk about it, but yeah, we do have uh, 2021 champion stuff online, bradybacon.com. Um, also die casts are finally going to be here. I think they're going to be here on Monday. So that's kind of cool. The only they're the small 164 scale die casts kind of in time for Christmas. 
pretty cool. I think we're the only non-wing sprint car team to have that. And obviously the Hoffman 69 car um, is pretty iconic. Iconic uh, for sure. So be sure to, you know, get online and get some of those. And we'll probably be having some more uh, bacon shopping network videos here as the, as the holidays approach. And she has a lot of cool, um, you know, sales and deals, 12 days of Christmas and, and stuff like that. So she works really hard on that and that definitely helps uh, keep us going. So keep an eye on our social media stuff for that and she'll have all kinds of goodies available. Perfect. Well, thanks for the time today, dude. I appreciate it. Thank you.